Hi everyone, we are ready to move on to our second case study of the semester and that is taking a look at cystic fibrosis. So there's a number of things that we're going to continue to build upon that we learned in our first case regarding DNA and we're going to put those things to use here in our next case study. So let's jump in and find out who our main characters are in our next case. We're actually going to be taking a look at a family, the Millers, and their interaction with their nurse practitioner, Yvonne. And there's some concern over the Miller's son. Uh, Jeffrey Miller is a six-month-old baby, and we know that they've done some genetic testing, and they have found that it is cystic fibrosis. So one of the first things that I wanted to start out with is that we are taking a look at a disorder disease here that is genetic. So let's talk a little bit about how this particular disease is passed down from parents to children and then we'll move forward and talk a little bit more about uh, what cystic fibrosis is. When we take a look at the inheritance of cystic fibrosis, we know that cystic fibrosis is going to be something that is not necessarily present in the parents. What it means though is that the parents are going to be carriers. So while we're going to spend more time talking about genetics later in our semester, I just very quickly wanted us to understand how Jeffrey could end up with cystic fibrosis where his parents, neither of them, have it. The particular way that cystic fibrosis is inherited is that it's a recessive disorder. And what that means is that you can have a carrier, like a dad here, who carries a cystic fibrosis gene but does not have cystic fibrosis. And in this particular picture you can see that the darker colored of the genes is going to be the one that's the cystic fibrosis. Um, mom is also a carrier of the gene. She does not have cystic fibrosis. So if we look at the potential offspring, what are the possibilities that they could have? Well, they could have a child that doesn't have cystic fibrosis. They could have two out of four children, 50% chance that they would have children who do not have cystic fibrosis, but they are carriers. And they have a 25% chance that they'll have a child with cystic fibrosis. And this is the category that Jeffrey is in. We know that he has inherited this from not one parent, not the other only, but both parents. And so that's where he is. Like I said, later this semester we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in terms of how this inheritance pattern actually works. But I did want us to clarify that this is a genetic disorder. There are many types of disorders that are inherited this way. Another example would be sickle cell anemia is also something that is inherited uh, from both parents and we know that parents can be carriers and then pass that on to their offspring. All right, well let's make our way back to the Millers and find out some things about um, the case itself. I hope you've had a chance to visit the website that's at the bottom of the screen so that you can read a little bit more about cystic fibrosis and answer some of the questions that are in your course manual. But let's take a look at some of the important things we need to know about the symptoms and the organ systems that are affected by cystic fibrosis. The main characteristic of cystic fibrosis is that when individuals produce mucus, the mucus consistency is very different from somebody who doesn't have cystic fibrosis. Now, Mucus is kind of gross to talk about, but when we think about mucus production in the body, it actually has a lot of functions in lots of different places. Uh, let's look at one right here on the right-hand side, and that is what mucus does for your lungs. Um, everyone, a normal airway right here, will produce mucus, and that mucus is there to trap particles and prevent those particles from going deeper into the lungs. And so everyone produces some mucus that's very thin. And in a healthy person, this mucus is not only thin, but it's kind of watery, and it's easy to remove. And when I say remove, it means that you have cilia, that may be lining your airway and when these cilia move together they're going to remove this mucus and then where does that mucus end up? Well it actually comes up your trachea and that small amount of mucus will end up at the back of your throat and you'll either swallow that mucus or if you've produced a lot of it sometimes people will clear their throat and then spit that out. So you generally don't notice this um, every minute you swallow a number of times and some of that is going to be mucus. You also, though, recognize when you have a cold, when you have some type of infection, that you can produce a lot more mucus, and you're probably a lot more of it, more aware of it then. 
Um, let's take a look at how this mucus is different in somebody with cystic fibrosis. If we took a sample of mucus from somebody with cystic fibrosis, we would find that their mucus is very thick and it's very sticky. And we can see it in this area of the picture here uh, being a much thicker area of mucus. And that means that it's much more difficult to clear out of that airway. Um, individuals may um, be coughing a lot in an effort to remove that, but it's much more difficult to remove. And because it sits in that airway, this is going to set up a scenario where bacteria can grow. Bacteria really like mucus, so if mucus is going to be present in an area, then those bacteria generally are going to break that down. So people with cystic fibrosis are really prone to these bacterial infections. And then overall, we can just see when we look at the size of the airway, um, how much larger it is in somebody who has a normal airway than somebody who is compromised. So normal airways are nice and open and all of that air is moving through it. But here you see this very narrow airway. And so individuals with cystic fibrosis have a difficult time just moving air to those areas where we need to extract oxygen and then get rid of the carbon dioxide. The airway is not the only place where mucus is important in the body. We also know in places involving the digestive system, like the pancreas and the intestines, mucus is produced as well. Mucus is, impo is important for helping substances move down ducts in the pancreas, and what's being produced in the pancreas are enzymes. Those enzymes will travel down these ducts that are lined with mucus and eventually make the, their way into the small intestine where those enzymes will be used. Well, if the mucus that is in those ducts are also thick and sticky and doesn't move, it's very difficult to deliver those enzymes to the small intestine. Therefore, um, people with cystic fibrosis oftentimes are deficient in being able to break down their food because they're not getting adequate amounts of enzymes arriving in the small intestine from the pancreas. And then also simply being able to absorb nutrients and move things through the digestive system is challenging. Mucus is necessary to fully absorb nutrients as well as to move the material, waste material, onward from the small intestine to the large intestine. So people with cystic fibrosis oftentimes have difficulty with their uh, digestive system as well. A couple of other areas that we might see affected, we know that it can affect reproductive organs, we know that it can even lead to infertility, and then finally we'll notice some differences in the skin, not because of mucus production directly, but because of some of the ways the cells are behaving in the skin, and what it results in is sweat, and you know that your sweat has some salt in it. Individuals with cystic fibrosis produce a really salty sweat. It's much, much more concentrated than what we would find in somebody who produces sweat um, and does not have cystic fibrosis. So what we need to do in our case is to go back to understanding our DNA and recognizing that Jeffrey has a genetic disorder. That genetic disorder is then a mutation that's going to be in the DNA and trace all the way to how this could lead to thick mucus. And we need to fill in all the steps that will occur as we make our way from understanding DNA to thick mucus. One of the most important parts of this is what's listed here in the bottom of this paragraph. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic mutation that's going to affect how cells function. And specifically, they're going to be influencing a protein and how a protein can be defective in individuals with cystic fibrosis. So that's actually the place that we need to start. We need to talk about what protein is the problem and how DNA is going to be involved in producing this malfunctioning protein. As a preview, let's just take a look at the particular protein that is problematic when we look at cystic fibrosis. When we look at cystic fibrosis, we're going to be examining a protein that's embedded in cell membranes. We've talked some about the structure of cell membranes already, and we know that when we look at cell membranes, there is a phospholipid bilayer. We also know that there are proteins embedded in that phospholipid bilayer.
what we'll find is that people who don't have cystic fibrosis produce a protein that's right here in blue embedded in that membrane that is going to work well to allow for chloride ions, you know what chloride ions are, uh, to actually move across membranes. And in this particular picture you can see the chloride ions are allowed to move from inside to the outside of the cell. However, in a person with cystic fibrosis, it's this particular protein that is the defective protein. And what you'll notice is that it's not allowing our chloride to move from one side of the membrane to the other. It's like the chloride is trapped here on the inside of the cell. And because of that, we'll see a change in the mucus on the outside of the cell. So specifically, that's the protein that we're going to be talking about. And what we're going to do in the next couple videos are talk about what this protein is, what it's made out of, how did it get here embedded in the membrane, and also talk about how DNA is part of making this defective protein.